good evening. I'm Mark Kaufman. I'm here with my wife, Leanna, and our five children, or four of our five children. And we are from Indiana. So this evening, I'm looking out here, and this is not a place that I want to be. But because of sin and because of death, I'm here this evening. But this evening, I'm hoping I can bring a, a side out of death, of creation, that gives us hope, that takes that sting away from death. And we see the theme verse up here. It's Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know what I have planned for you, says the Lord. I have plans to prosper you, not to harm you. I have plans to give you a future filled with hope. So this evening I hope I can bring that verse out and I can bring out what that verse means and what that hope is. And I'll get more into this in a little bit. So the reason I'm here this evening is because I have experienced death of a loved one. And I will share a little bit of my story here before we start. If you're like me, you like to know what is the speaker, why does he think he can speak on this topic? So when I was a young boy, I never thought that I would ever be doing this. I grew up in Ohio in uh, a very conservative uh, Mennonite setting, but because of uh, some church relations with my mom and dad, they went to separate churches. I started being friends with uh, youth from the Old Order Amish. And so being in that type of a setting, I got involved in alcohol and I became addicted to alcohol. But that was also where I met my first wife, Rosanna. And so we were married uh, in 1999. I was 20 and she was 19. And we had five children. Our oldest daughter, she is 19 and has plans to be married in the 1st of April. And our oldest son is 16. And the next daughter is 13. The next son is 11. And then we have a four-year-old. And the four youngest are here this evening. They're upstairs. And so if you see this picture, this is the last family picture that we had with my first wife. That was taken in 2017, about uh, two months before she died. So when I became a Christian, uh, well anyway, we were married in the Old Order Amish Church. So I grew up uh, singing and hearing the preaching in the High German. After we were married two years, we were still in the Amish Church and I was still addicted to alcohol. And because of some things, um, we started going to uh, a Beachy Mennonite church. Because of that, I accepted Christ while we were there in, in the Beachy Mennonite church. Because of the lifestyle that I grew up in, um, God put a ministry in my life of youth ministry, and we did that for six years. And because of the youth ministry of working with young men, there was one fellow that we ended up sending to Fresh Start. Through that, we were asked to come to Fresh Start as house parents and also as counselors. And so in 2015, we went to Fresh Start for a two-year term. And so we were there until April of 2017 is when my wife became sick and she went to the hospital on April 8th. She was in the hospital for uh, until May 5th. And that is when the doctors said they don't think they can do anything. And from there, we went to Tijuana um, to a cancer clinic to try to do something there. We should have done maybe something sooner, but um, June 12th is when she passed away in Tijuana, Mexico. And so we continued at Fresh Start until October, and we finished out our two-year term, and then we moved back to Ohio after that. And then in uh, September of 2018, I married Liana, and she is here this evening, and I will share more of that story tomorrow night. When I was first married, my dreams were to live a long life with my wife, but God had other plans. And so tonight, I want to look at what, what, what is God's plan for our life? 
And when we think of finding God in the midst of our grief, that is so hard to do when we have so much pain, so much hurt, and it just seems like the whole world comes falling in on us. But tonight, by me coming here and sharing this, we know in the Bible it says that God has to allow Satan to afflict us. When we take that, what God allows, what the, the evil that Satan brings into our life, when we take that and we use it to glorify God, we take the power away from Satan. So, before we get in here further, I want to talk about grief. Do not try to compare your grief with other people. Everybody grieves in their own way. And there is no right or no wrong way to grieve. I know for myself, it was when this happened, I, 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 didn't know, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what was right or what was wrong. Because I had not practiced. I had not thought about what is grieving. But God brought people into my life that had gone through this, that had experienced this, and they spoke wisdom into my life. So that's what I want to do tonight, is to try to share with you from my experience and also the experience that I have had working with other people to what is happening to me when a death of a loved one comes. Why do I feel the way that I do? How do I deal with those feelings? How do I cope? So here in Jeremiah 29, 11, we see... The Israelites, they were taken captive. They were taken to Babylon. And this was a foreign land. It was a foreign country for them. Everything was strange. And so they were crying out to God. They said, God, come help us. Deliver us. And so God gave these words to Jeremiah. And he said, uh, for I know the thoughts that I think. They said, they're thoughts of peace, not of evil. And I want to give you an expected end. Later on in that the next couple verses we see where God said to them, he said, go plant gardens. He said, plant vineyards and eat thereof. And he said, let your children be married. So God was telling them, I know what you want. I know where you're at. But he said, just stay where you're at. Be content where you're at for right now. I want to give you what you want. I want to give you what you're hoping for. And so tonight... My question to you is, what is that future that you're looking for? What is it that you're hoping for? As we go through this this evening, I, I'm hoping by the end of this evening, you will understand those thoughts of peace that God has for us. So we will be looking at his plan, at his purpose, and we'll be looking at why he created us. And we'll be looking at the completeness, the safety, and most of all, the contentment. And then we'll be looking at what are those things hoped for and for the outcome. Okay, the five stages of grief that we go through. I think it's very important that we recognize these five stages because it's very, almost everyone goes through these five stages. The first one is denial. I'm going to be looking a little bit out of the book of Job. And... I might not be reading the verses. I might just be quoting or paraphrasing some of the verses here. In Job chapter 3, Job is bewailing his birth. He is wondering, God, why was I born? We know the story of Job. We know that in, in the scriptures it says that Job was the most upright man that there was at that time. And so when Satan was walking there, God told Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? And Satan said, Well, He's, he's as good as he is because you've put a hedge of protection around him. And so God told Satan, he said, I'm going to take that hedge away. Do with him what you want. And we can just see that uh, what happened then. Satan, or death came into Job's life. The death of his children. He lost, he lost his wealth. So Job was showing a lot of confusion here in chapter 3. He wasn't sure what is happening. He was... He, 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 just, he, w- he just wished he wouldn't have been born. It was a, he, he didn't know how to handle this. So with denial, that often comes when perhaps you find out that someone is sick. Or one example that I'm going to give is a neighbor there where I grew up at, she had uh, told her husband goodbye that morning, and he had gotten on his bicycle, 
and left. And ten minutes later, someone was knocking on the door, and they said, your husband is dead on the road. And so her first reaction was, no, no, it's not my husband. I just, I just, he just went down the road. And then another thing that sometimes happened is just the confusion. Uh, everything is just, we, we don't know what's happening, and it just, we're all confused. In our minds, we think, well, maybe it's just a bad dream. I, I'm dreaming this. This, this can't be this way. And then comes the shock. Once it settles in that we realize, oh no, this, this has actually happened. You know, um, Liana's mom, we just found out two weeks ago that she has stage four cancer. And I just remember her reaction when she heard that on the phone. Her reaction was right at first, no, it, it, can't, it can't be this bad. And I just have to think there with, with my wife. And, and just, just to clarify, I'll, tonight when I'm speaking about my wife, I'm speaking about my first wife, Rose. When the doctors told us that her kidneys have shut down, they won't work again. You know, it, we were thinking, well, maybe we should go to a different doctor, to another doctor. Maybe he would know more. And then comes the denial part to where we think, well, you know, sometimes when someone has passed away and you can't accept it until you go to the funeral home and you actually see the dead body. And, you know, we just tell ourselves, you know, I, this, this is a dream. It, it, I'll wake up and it's going to all be back the way it was. One of the next stages there, and that is panic. One of the ways my oldest daughter dealt with that was, or that I saw this in her was when uh, her mom was sick in the hospital, she would go and she would clean the whole house. And I've heard uh, from people that I have talked to that maybe in their situation they have gone out and they have, you know, cleaned out a, a building on their land. And we, we do things that just, it's not normal for us. We, we do it and we don't realize what we're doing. We do it because we don't know what else to do. The next part we're going to look at is anger. And this can be a little controversial. And I'm going to share a little bit of how I came to see this. Growing up, I was taught, you don't get angry at God. But there's a difference in being angry at God or staying angry at God. When we stay angry at God, that is bitterness and that is sin. And so I just want to clarify that so you're not thinking that I'm saying, well, it's okay to stay angry at God. That's not what I'm saying here this evening. But when we uh, have the loss of a loved one, I think whether we realize it or not, we have anger towards God. I talked with a person last night that said, no, they don't have anger towards God. They're just disappointed. But I think what they're seeing as disappointed is actually anger directed towards God. And you know, when we pray for healing and we have anointing, but yet it just goes the other way. It, there's no healing there. Some of the questions that we might ask is, you know, did I do something, God, to deserve this? And God you know, does prayer not matter? We've been praying. Many people have been praying. Does that not matter to you, God? There at Fresh Start, there was a resident there. Well, maybe I should back up. We would have every Wednesday uh, like a big group counseling session. And we would pick out um, some faults of each other. Instead of just looking for the good things, we picked out faults. And we said, brother... I love you, but I have a concern about this. But one of the fellows said that it's not a good counseling session unless somebody gets angry or they cry. Because when we let our emotions really start rolling, that is when God can start speaking to us. And then I think, too, if we have anger towards God in our heart, even if we don't want to admit it, if we tell God that we are angry at him, he already knows that because he sees into our hearts. And so when we express that anger, it's for us to help us see that. And when we see that, it opens our heart to let God start speaking to us. One of the other ways we experience anger is directed towards other people. You don't understand what I'm going through, and you can't feel my pain. You know, when a dog gets its foot caught in a trap... 
you go and you try to get that dog's foot out of that trap, he is going to bite you. Because in his mind, you are the one causing the pain. And that's why when we suffer pain, we tend to have anger and we express it towards others. In Job 30, Job's talking about, or he's looking back and he is remembering his wealth, he's remembering his children, he's remembering his health. And we see Job, he's in that depression stage. He's depressed. He's missing those things. He's wanting those things back again. And so when we recognize their loss and we see that things will never be the same again for the ones that have lost a partner, crawling into an empty bed at night and there's that empty spot and you know it's not going to be the same again. I think of parents that have lost children and you know they see maybe the empty shoes or the toys and they know they won't get played with again and we start grieving our loss and we wish we could go back and change things and and we think maybe if we would have tried this other medical treatment or maybe if i would have done something different things would be different you know thinking of coming home to an empty house but in our hearts we know it's not possible to go back and that's when that depression settles in it just it overwhelms us. It's like a, a heavy weight pushing down on us. And the future, the future looks impossible. You think, well, how can I face life? But speaking from some of my experiences, how can I raise five children on my own? And we wonder, how will my financial needs be met? This is especially for maybe the widows. And we think of, how will my emotional needs be met? You know, so often something happened um, during that time where... I thought, well, I want to tell my wife about this. And then I realized, uh, I can't. And there were even times that I already had my phone out and I was going to text her. And, you know, it was one of those moments when I threw my phone because I couldn't, I, I realized, what, what am I doing? I can't text her. Then the question, how can I raise a family? You know, for a widower, it's a little different. We are expected to go out and work. But we come home and there's still laundry to do, there's dishes to do, there's food to cook. And when we had children, I never thought I would have to take my daughter shopping for underwear. But that's, that's part of, of where, where you are in a situation like this. Maybe for the widows, they face different things with their sons. Things that they should have a, a father there for. When you face all those things, it's... It's so easy to fall into that depression. And so the next step is acceptance. Accepting what God has for us. Actually, I will be looking more at the acceptance tomorrow evening, but I just want to talk on it a little bit tonight. Later on here in the book of Job, we see where Job was questioning God. God, how could you do all these things? How could a just, loving God do this? And then in Job 39... God starts challenging Job. And then in chapter 39, verse 3 and 4, Job says to the Lord, he said, Who am I? I'm just going to put my hand on my mouth and not say anything. And so we see that when we are in that depression, we ask God, God, where are you? We have that anger towards God. God, how could you? And then God says, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? And so when he says, where are you when I laid the foundations of the earth? And we see the greatness and the holiness of God. We can only put our hand on our mouth and say, who am I? So in order to see that glory, that glorious God, our creator, our Abba Father, I want to go back and look at the foundations of man. So what does it mean to be created in the image of God? It's not in the physical sense. I look out here and I see people of every different shape and size. But what God meant here was as far as in the spirit, in the eternal sense, once we are born, our spirit will live forever. And we have been given the knowledge of right and wrong, and we have been given the ability to make choices in right and wrong. So why did God create us? Think about this. If a third of the angels were cast down with Satan, that would mean that God lost a third of his glory. So who's going to worship God? 
In Exodus 34, 14, it says, Thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous. We see here God is jealous. And we as humans, we know what jealousy is. We see two children. One has something, and another wants it, and they start fighting. And we've all heard the stories of those husbands that have come home and found their wives with another man, and they've killed him. So we see God created man for his glory, to serve him and to worship him. Would it not bring more glory to God if he created man with a choice to serve him? If you think of having a dog, a pet dog, would you rather have that dog come running up to you, wagging his tail and all happy? Or would you rather go out and catch that dog by the chain and drag him up to you just to pet him and he's there dragging his feet and doesn't want to come to you. That's what God wants with us. He wants us to come to him willingly and excited. Think about this. God gave his perfect creation into the hands of Satan. God allows Satan to do with us however he pleases. And so man lives in this life of sin and all of a sudden he sees his need of a savior. And so then he repents and he turns away from sin and from Satan, and he turns back to God. That is the ultimate picture of a jealous God. There in Ohio, uh, one of the ministers in our home church had this saying, and he said that we were created perfect. God knew us in the womb before he made us. So that we're born into imperfection because of the sin of the garden, in the Garden of Eden, because of Adam sinning, we are imperfect while we're being perfected and that's talking about the things that god allows into our life whether it's pain uh, sickness death of a loved one that's being perfected so that again we can be perfect and that is at the judgment and so god is a god of revenge and what could be a greater humiliation to satan than to have something that was given to him do something Satan did not do, and that is repent. God created man to fill that void that the angels left that were cast out. And so, when did all of this happen? When, when was Satan and his angels cast out? I'm not sure if we have an exact moment, but in these next scriptures, uh, we will get a very good idea of maybe when it could have happened. Satan was thrown out of heaven Somewhere between the point when the Garden of Eden was created and the creation of man. Exactly yes. where in that point, I'm not quite sure. So I hope with this, what we've looked at right now, you can kind of see why did God need us? Why did he create us in a sinful world? Why did he allow death into this world? As we continue this evening to look at why God has allowed death, I'm hoping this, this will bring a peace to you to know that there is no such thing as an accidental death and there's no thing as a coincidence or things of that sort with God. So I think now I will be looking a little bit of the story in 1 Samuel of Hannah and Samuel. We don't often think of Hannah and the story with her as to have anything to do with grieving. And even though she does not face death of a loved one, she is still grieving. And that's what I want to look at tonight. And so in 1 Samuel 1 verse 10, it says, She was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. Here Hannah, she was in the grieving process. She wanted a child. She Oh, she desperately wanted a child. And we see here as... Uh, she was in the temple. Eli saw her and he thought she was drunk. And then in verse 15, Hannah says, no, I, I, I'm not drunk. She says, I'm a woman of a sorrowful spirit. She said, I have neither drunk wine nor strong drink, but I have poured out my soul before the Lord. And we see as she goes through, God answered her prayer and gave her a son. But she, had made a, she made a bargain with God. She said, God, if you'll give me a son, I'll give him back to you. Hannah recognized that her son was lent to her by God. And when God blessed her with that son, she didn't just say, no, God, forget it. I'm, I'm going to keep him. But she recognized that her son was lent. You know, if we think about 
our children or our partners, they're not truly ours. They're lent to us by God. And so it's God's choice to take them back. I will be looking at some more of that here tomorrow. But I just want to keep, yeah, I just wanted to bring that out in, in, in Hannah. It goes on here in the story to where every year she took him a coat. And I think that fits into our grieving when we have lost a loved one. There's times when we go back and we remember that loved one. Maybe it's on the day of the death or maybe their birthday. And I have to wonder what went through Hannah's mind when she took that coat to the temple for her son every year and she knew she couldn't take him along home again. And I think as any mother would probably be able to relate, I'm guessing Hannah cried. But we see then on into the story because Hannah surrendered to the Lord. She kept the vow that she had given to God. God blessed her. God blessed her with three more sons and two daughters after that. But she had to surrender her son to the Lord. Just the way Hannah cried out to God, we know that when we are in the midst of that grief, we only have one choice, and that is to cry out to God. And for the most part, we're in that by ourselves. We're in there alone. You know, we can anoint our head and wash our face so that others may not see exactly how deep that we are grieving. And what a better place to take that is at the mercy seat of God. I have written here on the notes, it says, We need not vow our vows to bribe God to help us, but the gifts of his love are more blessed for him to give than for us to receive. So that is the story of Hannah, of Hannah grieving, of coming to God, of vowing a vow to God, of bargaining with God, but she went through with that bargain. And because she was faithful and she called out to God, God blessed her. So the next part here, I want to look at there's a time for everything. The ecclesiastic writer wrote here, he said, there is a time to be born and a time to die. And we know the scripture where it says, I know your uprising and thy down sitting. We think about those scriptures, we see that God knows our birth and he knows our death. And so when my wife passed away, she was 36. And in our minds, that is young. And I could question all the treatments that we did and I could think, should we have done something different? But yet it was very plain to us. We had anointing services. And at that anointing service, God gave us peace. He gave us peace that he was not going to heal the physical body. But God revealed to us what true healing is. It's not physical healing, it's eternal healing. It's about putting away the corruptible body and putting on the incorruptible. In 1 Corinthians 15 it says, for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. And so, if we think about our earthly bodies and we know of people that are crippled that have limbs missing and we know of people that have cancer and their bodies are being eaten up by cancer when we consider that and we consider what our heavenly bodies will be no one has entered heaven without dying except for two men and that was Enoch and Elijah if that's where our hope and our desire is is to be in heaven with God we have no choice but to die. There in 1 Corinthians 15, 54, it says, death is swallowed up in victory. And so death is a gift that is given to us by God. But that doesn't deny that it hurts the ones that are still here, the ones that love that person that died. But when we can see God's plan, the way he created man, why he created man, and we see that death was part of God's plan. In 1 Peter, uh, I think it's chapter 3, it says that Jesus was given to us for a redeemer before the foundations of the earth were laid. There we see that God had planned for death. He put that tree in the garden, not with the intentions that man would not take from it. But he had the intentions that man would take from it. But God in his all-knowing, 
had already provided a solution for sin. Because if we would say that God created man not to sin, and man sinned, we would be saying God has made a mistake, and God doesn't make mistakes. With that, we see that God created death for his glory. That takes some of the sting away from that death when we realize this is part of God's plan. Jesus so ich bin leweg die Wahrheit des Leben. Niemand kommt zum Vater, but they me. Jesus had to die. And Jesus said, because I died, you have to follow the way that I have gone. That's the only way that we can spend eternity with Christ in heaven. God has not allowed death to hurt us, but rather as a way to join him in eternity. And so Paul said here in his letter to the Philippians, he said, For me to, to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's the first part this evening is it's not about life here on this earth. And so whatever God brings into our life to draw us to him, whether it's pain, sickness, death, and so it's worth it. In January of 2017, before my wife died, there at Fresh Start, we would have a staff meeting. And my prayer request was, was that God would show me what perfect surrender is. And that prayer request, if I would have known how God was going to answer that request, I probably would not have asked it. But God used the death of my wife to show me what true surrender is. When there, I came to a point where I could not do anything and I had to surrender her to God and say, God, she's yours. God knew what it took for me to experience full surrender. And when we have that desire in our hearts to know God closer and we ask God to bring us closer to him, then God will answer that request and he will do it in a way that we don't expect. But because of God's love for us, anything that he can do to draw us to him, to help us spend eternity with him in glory. And so if I would have allowed the death of my wife to draw me away from God, then her death would have been in vain. The last several hours before she passed away, we had time to talk. And her request for her funeral message was that it would be a revival message. She had quite a few family from the Old Order Amish that would, they would never set foot inside a church building other than for a funeral or a wedding. Because of that funeral message that was preached, I, I'm not exactly sure anymore of the numbers. I'm thinking it was six or seven that came to Christ because of that funeral message. And one of her requests to me was that I would not let her death be in vain. By me speaking here, and for those of you that have lost a loved one, if you follow after God, even though through all the hurts and the pain, you follow after God, you are taking power away from Satan. When we take that and we glorify God, it makes it everything worth it. That is the whole reason God has created us, is to glorify him in all things. In all things, God is good. Land, welch ein Tag, 
Ich ins gelobte Land, welch ein Tag. 